This is a game of chess that was played in 1851 in London at uh, one of the wor world's first international chess tournaments. It was about 16 players and they were from a bunch of different countries uh, and this game was actually played between rounds between two of the participants in the tournament um, at a coffee shop down the street. This game is called The Immortal Game because it's a great game of chess and it's famous for being such a crazy game with such a, a cool checkmate at the end. So um, white is played by a guy named Anderson and black is played by a guy named Kierzitsky. Um, white plays e4, e5, f4. Pawn takes f4, bishop c4. Okay, um, this right here is the king's gambit. The idea is to give up a center pawn to, um, to be able to gain control and attack. Sometimes you'll, you'll see this move. And this is um, just kind of gaining the center. But this is another way to, to do it. Develop the pieces and get the attack going. Um, and now, this isn't really played that much anymore, the king's gambit, and the reason is because it exposes white's king side and can be kind of risky. So black plays queen h4 check, and now, now if, g, if g3 pawn takes g3, and there's going to be a lot of trouble because uh, this pawn is pinned right here, so he captures back, the rook is lost. So black plays king, h, king f1, and now, now black... Uh, decides to sacrifice the pawn back to get some of the initiative back. So black plays pawn to b5. And this is really uncommon nowadays, but you'll see it here um, at this period of time in the 1850s. Bishop takes b5, and now knight f6. And now this position here, I believe both players had seen this position before, at least black had, but, but this was not an uncommon position and they still had opening theory in their mind. So now white plays knight f3, taking the queen, um, and the queen goes to h6, and now pawn to d3, defending the pawn which was attacked. And in this position black plays knight to h5. And the point of this move is to come here and fork the king and the rook, um, let's say if, if white ignores it, check, and if the pawn takes, the rook is captured again. So that, that's a big threat. And so you can see that this move already, that this f pawn being moved can, already is already creating problems. So here, uh, Anderson plays knight to h4, and I like this move because it is... Uh, somewhat active and it's not just um, it responding to the threat of knight g3 check with uh, like a passive move like uh, I don't know something like this because it, it, it's a it's a move that has a dual purpose okay so now uh, black plays queen to g5 and this is, this looks like a pretty good move because it double attacks both the knight and the bishop and so now white plays knight to f5. And now white had, uh, when white played knight to h4, white had definitely seen knight to, or queen to g5 and had been planning this. Okay. And now here black plays pawn to c6, attacking the bishop. That was one reason the pawn of sacrifice was uh, it allows the bishop to be attacked with the pawn move and hopefully get some development out of it. Now, white plays pawn to g4. And this move, uh, I like it because white's trying to gain the initiative, and white doesn't just retreat right away, but white makes a counterattack. Um, and now, black plays queen to f6. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Black plays knight to f6. And black could capture here, but pawn captures. It's... Um, not looking too good, but the rook is probably going to come here. Um, 
So black plays knight to f6. And now, now uh, Anderson comes up with a brilliant move, plays rook to g1. And this is a really great move because he's sacrificing a piece, um, but he's doing it to gain the initiative with h4. And it de the reason he, he moved it is because it defends the g pawn um, and uh, prepares h4. If h4 was played without the rook on g1, then the queen would just capture. So pawn takes bishop, h4, and now the queen retreats. And, and I believe the next few moves Anderson had probably calculated. Um, h5, uh, well here obviously the queen couldn't go to h6 because of the knight. Um, so this was the only move, and it's easier to calculate moves when everything is forced. So here, you know, it's pretty obvious that this is the only move that's going to be played. Um, h5, again, queen g5, This is, these are the only moves that black can play, so it's not too hard to calculate it. And now white plays queen to f3. And now this is a good move because it, it threatens to... Uh, Trap the queen, actually. Knight to g8 in retreats. And you know you're doing good if your opponent is wasting time. So basically, uh, this, let's just take a look at what the knight's moves have done. The knight has gone here, and then here, and then here, and then here. So not very useful to use four moves where you end up in the same spot. Uh, but the knight is trying to free the queen to come back. Okay, so now bishop takes f4, queen f6, attacking the b2 pawn, and now white goes knight to c3. And this position, if we look at the development, four pieces, maybe even five, uh, for white, and just one, just the queen for black. So this is a pattern to a lot of the games I've shown. Okay, and now... Uh, black plays bishop to c5. And this move, it looks pretty good because it attacks the rook, and black has got to get developed. So, in this position, uh, Anderson is really going for an attack, so he plays knight to d5. And now... This move attacks the queen and threatens to fork the king and the rook. So black plays queen takes b2. Now this threatens to take the rook with check and then grab the second rook as well. And in this position, everything is getting really crazy. We should keep in mind that there's a check over here, which the queen is defending as well. In this position, white is going for the all-out attack, doesn't just want the rook here, but uh, wants the king, so white plays bishop to d6. And I'm going to end part one here and go to part two for the rest of the game. Okay, now you're probably beginning to see why this game might be called the immortal game and be famous. But in this position, there's a ton going on. Um, the move bishop d6 kind of starts to trap the black king, and uh, it also attacks the bishop. Um, now, Okay, the first thing we should look at is the most obvious move. What if this doesn't look like the best move for black, but well, black in the game plays bishop takes g1, which is actually a mistake. Um, and probably queen takes this rook was better. But um, first we should look at, well, first we should look at bishop takes d6, and then. Knight takes d6, check. The king cannot go here. Um, 
And so the king must go to d8 if king f8, checkmate. Um, so king goes to d8, and now after queen takes f7, it looks really hard to stop checkmate. Um, if the knight comes out, it's mate this way. Um, if this knight comes out, it's mate this way. Um, and, and just, yeah, oh yeah, the knight would come out this way to prevent the checkmate on e8, by the way. That was one idea. And now, so the only move it looks like black has is queen to e5, but even this um, does not work to queen f8 check. And the king has no escape squares. All right. Okay. The king has no escape squares. So it's winning again. Okay. That's forced mate, it looks like. Um, so bishop takes d6 is bad. Okay. So now, now we'll go through the game, which was bishop takes g1. But uh, we will go back and look at this move. Rook takes, uh, queen takes a1. So after bishop takes um, g1, okay, there is a, a lot going on. Um, first, okay, there's a check over here. This is still being attacked. And uh, one good idea when you're trying to find checkmate is it's called producing a mating net, which means um, you're trying to look at every single square the king could go to, and you want to eliminate that square as a possibility. So, here one good one good reason the one re good fact about the bishop being on d6 is that it's taking it's creating a mating net and taking away some of the escape squares for the king. Okay, now white still cannot check on g7 right here, so um, white plays the move pawn to e5. And this is a really great, brilliant move because um, there's a checkmate coming and it blocks the queen from saving the rook. And it blocks the queen from saving the pawn. And now check is threatened. And it just gives up another rook. And you can see, like you learn, oh, it's important to save material. But in this position, checkmate's a bigger threat. So black can... Uh, take the rook and it's going to be pretty risky. So queen takes a1. King e2. And in this position to stop the check here on c7 black plays knight to a6 and now White goes, knight takes g7 check. The king comes to e8, and now you might want to pause this. There's checkmate in two here, and take it as a puzzle. Queen takes, or queen to f6 check. Triple exclamation point. Um, knight takes, and bishop e7 checkmate. And now this is a great game because black is down... Or black is up um, a piece, a rook, two rooks, and a queen. And the only pieces, aside from pawns, that white has are uh, being used to checkmate. So now let's go back. Where did black make their biggest mistake? Um, and we can say that... The first world champion, Steinitz, analyzed this game, and he said that in this position, it would have been better to go queen takes a1, and then after king e2, not to be greedy and take the rook, but to go queen to b2. Now this is important because it, it, uh, it still defends the pawn, and it creates a counterattack here. So now something like bishop takes. We can have queen takes c2 check. And after queen takes c5, it's, it's a little easier to defend. 
but uh, um, white would not capture the bishop. White could play here, and it's uh, still a game of chess, but it's by all means not finished. So let's just go through the last part of the game so we can end on that. Um, bishop takes rook was played in the game. E5, queen takes, they want to check, king e2, knight a6, knight takes g7, king d8, and queen f6, knight takes, bishop e7, checkmate. And I think the most important thing you should take away from this game is that um, the initiative is important in chess. And this game should just be appreciated for being really cool. And it was not played in the tournament. It was pl this was played at a coffee shop, but it's it's remembered as the immortal game because, uh, it, like a game a game of chess like this, it's like a piece of art.